Hi, my name is Dr. Judy Wolf. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Vermilion, and today we're going to be talking about caring for pelvic masses and malignancies. The course components today are four screening for ovarian cancer, the workup of an adnexal mass, when to operate, when to refer, and finally managing ovarian cancer in the operating room. The first topic is screening for ovarian cancer. In the United States this year, it's estimated that there, there are almost 55,000 new cases of uterine cancer and just over 10,000 deaths. For ovarian cancer, there's just over 21,000 new cases and over 14,000 deaths. And for cervical cancer, just under 13,000 new cases and 4,000 deaths. The most important thing to note about this slide is that although endometrial cancer or uterine cancer is more than twice as common as ovarian cancer, there are more deaths from ovarian cancer than, um, than uterine cancer and almost as more than, than the two combined. The average age or the mean age of ovarian cancer diagnosis is 60 years and the lifetime risk is 1 in 1.4 percent. One of the issues is the symptoms, although there are symptoms, they're quite vague and about 70 percent of the time, by the time a woman is diagnosed, she has advanced stage disease when the cure rate is 30 percent or less. And if you look on the left side, you see three of the famous women who've had ovarian cancer, Gilda Radner, Liz Tilberis, and Madeline Kahn. And unfortunately, all of them had advanced stage disease and died of their disease. But where we could really make a difference is if we found ovarian cancer early, where the cure rate is 75 to 90%. So when um, a woman is diagnosed with ovarian cancer, there, it can, as I mentioned, it's heterogeneous, meaning it can come from, they're different in every woman. And there are basically three types of ovarian cancer that come from different types of cells that are in the ovary. The most common type of ovarian cancer, which makes up about 85% of ovarian cancers, is what is called epithelial ovarian cancer. And the epithelium is this, are the cells that line the surface of the ovaries and line the surface of the follicles where the eggs are made inside. Epithelial ovarian cancer has multiple subtypes, the most common of which is serous carcinoma, but there are also subtypes such as mucinous and clear cell which you'll hear a little bit about in the talk. The other 15% of ovarian cancers are either stromal tumors, which are tumors that arise from the cells that make estrogen and progesterone, or germ cell tumors, which are tumors that arise from the eggs or the, the eggs themselves. Epithelial ovarian cancers are more common in postmenopausal women. Stromal tumors are more common in women in the 45 to 55 age range, although they can happen in any time. And the germ cell tumors are more common in young women. The male corollary of germ cell tumors of the ovary is testicular cancer. And if you think about that, that's a, a cancer that's common more in young men than older men. The fortunate thing about germ cell tumors is that even if they're present with an advanced stage, with the correct chemotherapy, they're often cured. The strategies for cancer risk reduction are to quantify individual risk factors for ovarian cancer, screening, chemo prevention, and preventive surgery, and we'll talk a little bit about each of these. The risk factors for ovarian cancer, the things that increase the risk of a woman getting ovarian cancer, most importantly probably is family history, but also nulliparity, never having been pregnant, or infertility. Things that then, on the other hand, decrease the risk of, of ovarian cancer are multiparity, having multiple children, using the oral contraceptive pills. In fact, if a woman uses oral contraceptives for five years or more throughout her lifetime, that decreases her risk of ovarian cancer for 50%, by 50%, not just while she's on the pill, but lifetime. Also, breastfeeding and tubal ligation. And the reasons for these are that there is some correlation between the number of times a woman ovulates over her life and her risk for ovarian cancer. So while you're on the birth control what pill, while you're breastfeeding, while you're pregnant, you don't ovulate. And so those things therefore reduce your risk. The tubal ligation may have something to do with actually removing part of the fallopian tube, as recent data has suggested that some ovarian cancers actually probably start from the end of the fallopian tube. The hereditary types of ovarian cancer, there are several different hereditary syndromes that increase the risk of ovarian cancer. And the amount of ovarian cancer that's hereditary, meaning it's inherited, it's not something that you acquire, 
is actually probably closer to 15% now. There are some undiscovered single genes, and then there's a large proportion of the hereditary component, which is related to BRCA or BRCA2 mutations, which increase the risk of both breast and ovarian cancer and some other cancers. And then there's something else called HNPCC or the Lynch type syndrome, Lynch, Lynch tooth type syndrome that increases the risk of not only ovarian cancer, but endometrial cancer and colon cancer among others. If you look at a woman who has a inherited, inherited mutation in either the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, and look at her risk of developing ovarian or breast com cancer compared to the general population, you can see that for breast cancer, the risk for the general population is just over 10%, and it's as, as high as 85% if she has a mutation. And for ovarian cancer, again, that 1.4% and up to between 45 and 50% lifetime risk of getting ovarian cancer. With the HNPCC syndrome, as I mentioned, colon and uterine cancer are very common. In women who have one of these mutations, uterine cancer is the most common cancer. And um, the risk of ovarian cancer, if you have a mutation in HNPCC, one of the HNPCC genes, it's about 11 or 12 percent lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. So not as high as a BRCA mutation, but still um, quite much higher than the general population. And in general, women who have these syndromes um, are recommended to have prophylactic surgery, both a hysterectomy and a BSO or removal of her tubes and ovaries. Screening for ovarian cancer is quite a challenge, and the reason that screening is a challenge are several. One is that the incidence is quite low. If you look at women who are premenopausal, the incidence is one in every 10,000, and even in postmenopausal women where it's more common, it's one in 2,500. So screening for any disease that is rare um, is, is always a challenge. Um, also, the anatomy of where the ovaries lie, they're not easily to be, easy to be biopsied, and in order to get a diagnosis, it requires invasive surgery. So if you have a screening test that overcalls the risk of ovarian cancer, in order to rule it out, the woman has to have surgery. And if you do too many surgeries where you don't find anything wrong or don't find cancer, you're more likely to harm a woman from doing the surgery than from, um, from her getting chances of getting ovarian cancer. Also, we don't really understand the natural history of ovarian cancer. We don't have a pre-malignant lesion. For cervical cancer, the pap smear works great because there's this long pre-malignant changes of the cervix related to infection with HPV that allow you to diagnose um, an abnormality prior to invasive cancer developing. Ovarian cancer is also quite heterogeneous, meaning there's not just one type. Um, there's many types and subtypes of ovarian cancer. CA125 has been evaluated and studied almost to death as a screening test for ovarian cancer. One of the challenges is that it was developed as a good marker for advanced ovarian cancer and in stage one ovarian cancer where the, the cancer is confined to the ovary and the cure rate is 90%, it's only elevated about 50% of the time. In addition, um, other things that aren't ovarian cancer can cause an elevation of CA125 falsely, things like fibroids, endometriosis, being on your period, having had surgery, any kind of liver disease, and these false positives are especially common in premenopausal women, as you can imagine. One of the large screening trials that was published several years ago was the PLCO screening trial. This was prostate, lung, colon, and ovarian cancer. It was a randomized trial of screening versus observation for over 78,000 women aged 55 to 74, so the age range when most women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And it evaluated screening simultaneously with an ultrasound and a CA-125, but what the results of that trial showed that it did not decrease ovarian cancer mortality and false positives led to an increase in complications compared to usual follow-up. And that's the issue is that false positives lead to surgery. Screening in the general population, CA-125 alone with transvaginal ultrasound annually does not decrease mortality. And then more recently, something called ROCA, which is looking at the change in CA-125 over time. 
um, is yet to be determined. There was some early data presented earlier this year at the SGO meeting and published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, suggesting that it could pick up cancers. However, it did not change the stages in which those cancers were diagnosed. And um, currently it's not recommended unless it's done as part of a clinical trial. The ROCA trial was actually a large trial done in the UK. So screening in the high risk population, what about those women who do have a known mutation in either one of the Lynch genes or BRCA01 or BRCA2 or for some reason they're felt to be high risk because of family history or something else. ASCO does recommend screening for these women with CA125 and pel pelvic ultrasound, although it hasn't been proven to be beneficial. Um, and also recommends chemo prevention. Remember I discussed that, ovar that use of oral contraceptives decreases the risk of ovarian cancer. And so using oral contraceptives in premenopausal women or using tamoxifen, which also decreases the risk of breast cancer in postmenopausal women. ASCO also discusses risk-reducing surgery, which for women with BRCA mutations or HNPCC, um, to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer would re be removal of the tubes and ovaries. And that's recommended to be done either 10 years earlier than the youngest diagnosis of ovarian cancer in the family, if there has been someone with the diagnosis, or at the completion of childbearing. Let's go ahead and move on then to when to operate and when to refer with the workup of an adnexal mass. Well, how common are adnexal masses? In premenopausal women, the annual incidence is 14%. So 13 million women a year have an adnexal mass. The prevalence at any given time is 30%, 27 million women. Postmenopausal women is less common, 5%, 1.5 million for the incidence, 16%. 5 million for the prevalence. Why is it more common in premenopausal women? Well, that's because women who are premenopausal and are ovulating have follicles develop every month, and some of those turn into a cystic lesion that is detected either on exam or ultrasound, um, and many of those will go away on their own. Of those that remain and don't go away and resume or reabsorb physiologically, 30% of the unilocular or single um, balloon like cyst. Uh, retain and 45% of complex tumors will persist. If a woman has a mass and the doctor is considering whether or not she needs to have surgery, the preoperative workup generally includes both a history and physical exam, symptomatology, are there any symptoms, are those symptoms anything that could be related to ovarian cancer, an abdominal and pelvic exam, it's really key, and I have to say this is a GYN oncologist when a pelvic exam is done, that not just a speculum exam and a, and a bimanual exam is done, but that also a rectovaginal exam be done. That means the doctor examines the woman with one hand on the lower abdomen, one finger in the vagina, one in the rectum. This allows the doctor to feel the ovaries even if they're hiding behind the uterus. Imaging may also be obtained, the most common imaging and the best imaging to, to look at the adnexa, the ovaries and the tubes is the transvaginal ultrasound, but sometimes a CT or an MRI is done. Quite infrequently a PET scan is done. These days it's very difficult to get PET scans um, covered by any insurance unless there's a good clear indication for them. And if you look at those listed imaging tests, the cheapest one is the transvaginal ultrasound, the PET scan the most expensive. When evaluating the mass, um, biomarkers are also used. CA125 is probably the most common, but there are some others depending on the uh, quality of the mass and the age of the woman that, that the doctor might consider using. If you look at how well these things um, perform and you look at the pelvic exam, and this is a um, slide showing three separate studies um, with a large number of patients, and how many times cancers were found. Well, if you look, there's 160 some thousand women in these studies um, done over many years and 12 cancers detected. That's because the pelvic exam is just not that good at feeling the ovaries. Again, if you look at the picture on the right side, depending on how heavy the lady is, how uncomfortable she is with the exam, if her abdominal muscles tightened or if she has six or eight inches of fat in front of the muscles, being able to feel even the uterus can be quite challenging. What about the transvaginal ultrasound? Well, as I mentioned, it's the most widely used imaging modality. Nothing is superior to it, and again, it's not that expensive. The advantages are, 
of it is that it's widespread availability. Most obstetrician gynecologists have them in their offices because um, they're, they're screening pregnant women with ultrasound all the time. It's very well tolerated by most women and it's cost effective. However, one of the limitations is that there are a lot of times indeterminate findings on imaging. You see something, you see something that's not normal, but you can't tell what it is. And also depending on who's looking at it, they may interpret it different, differently. And you don't know how much history is related to what you find. So there's variable disclosure on risk factors and it has low sensitivity for early stage cancers and premenopausal women. One of the challenges with the ultrasound is if you're not the person actually doing the ultrasound and seeing the images as they move by and all you're seeing are the static images that are chosen to take a picture of, you can miss a lot. There are some characteristics of ultrasound that are considered either clearly benign or clearly malignant. So it's more likely to be benign if it's unilateral, simple, unilocular, again, just like a balloon filled with water or just having some thin septations no ascites or fluid in the pelvis, and if it resolves, obviously. Characteristics of malignant masses are more, they're more commonly bilateral, complex, so they're not like just a balloon filled with water. They're a balloon filled with all kinds of things, with thick septations, internal papillations or growths. The presence of ascites or fluid is, is obviously a, a, a high risk factor for malignancy, and persistence or growth of the mass. A paper published by Scott Goodrich et al., earlier this year show that the risk of malignancy missing being missed by an ultrasound is 23 percent. He reviewed all of the ultrasounds in our two pivotal trials in the cancers and found that if you just looked at the ultrasound results alone using these kinds of criteria you would miss 23 percent of ovarian cancers. Well you can add something called color doppler to ultrasound and what that does is it looks at altered angiogenesis or blood flow in a growth, in a, in a new growth or neoplastic growth. <clears throat> what happens is that the, the blood flow that goes to a malignant mass um, is not very well de developed in it in, and those vessels don't have much muscle in them. And so there's high flow velocity and low impedance. So you see increased flow um, suggestive of malignancy because of the type of vessels that develop in a malignant mass. Um, if you do percutaneous or through the skin FNA, fine needle aspiration or cytology of a cystic ovarian mass, um, you might not pick up cancer even if it's there and you can miss it anywhere from a quarter to more than 80% of the time. And if you just aspirate the fluid out of a cystic tumor, even if it's benign and you just take it out with a skinny needle, it'll fill itself up uh, again within a year almost half of the time. But the worst thing that can happen is that if you have an ovarian cancer that's confined to the ovary and it's not spread anywhere and you put a hole in it, that can leak everywhere and it can disseminate the cancer, upstage the patient, and obviously then worsen the prognosis. So say no to ovarian tumor biopsy. I mentioned that um, CA125 is the most common biomarker that's used in evaluating an adnex or ovarian mass. These are some of the other ones. CEA can be elevated in certain types of ovarian malignancies. It's more commonly associated with GI malignancies, especially colon cancer. CA199, again, sometimes in ovarian cancer, more commonly thought of as a marker for pancreatic cancer. And then LDH, beta HCG, and AFP are common markers for certain types of ovarian cancer, but these are the less common stromal and germ cell tumors, not the epithelial tumors that are associated with CA125. HE4 is a marker that is specifically associated with epithelial ovarian cancers and kind of mirrors elevation uh, like CA125 does. Well, what is CA125? First of all, CA125 is the 125th marker protein that was identified in the blood that was elevated in the majority of women with advanced ovarian cancer. It's a protein that's derived from the salomic epithelium. That's the cells that cover the, the pericardium, the pleura, and the peritoneum, the lining of the inside of the abdomen, and the mullerian epithelium, which is the fallopian tubes, the endometrium, and the endocervix. As I mentioned, it's expressed by 80% of advanced ovarian cancer 
But some types of ovarian cancer, it's not very well expressed at all. In fact, mucinous cancers, clear cell cancers, are notorious for having normal CA125s. And as mentioned earlier, the, one of the challenges is only about half of early stage cancers overexpress um, CA125. HE4 is an antigen that's uh, derived from the human epididymis protein. Well, if you know anything about anatomy and ep um, biology, you would think that that would have something to do with men, but it actually is the counterpart in women. Um, and it's overexpressed in, in patients with especially epithelial ovarian cancer. Normal is less than 150. It has been FDA approved to monitor cancer treatment with other clinical methods. Um, but it shouldn't be used for monitoring women who have cell types that HE4 does not, is not overexpressed in. So I think of HE4 is a newer developed and less commonly used form of CA125. So what is the ACOG guidelines for referral of a pelvic mass to a GYN oncologist? They recommend that women who are premenopausal or less than 50 years of age and have a CA125 of greater than 200, evidence of ascites or distant metastasis by exam or imaging, and a first degree um, family history of breast or ovarian cancer be referred to a GYN oncologist prior to surgery. For postmenopausal women, it's the same, but the CA125 level is lower to greater than 35. Normal CA125 is considered 35 or less, but because there are so many benign conditions in premenopausal women that can elevate it, that on its own is not enough uh, to, alarm, to alarm a physician unless it's quite elevated. If the CA125 were 1500, that would be very worrisome for cancer. So what does a naive user rely on? And this is a question asked, what methods do you currently use to stratify the risk of adnexal mass for a ovarian malignancy, and these are providers who care for women um, with adnexal masses. And most doctors will say that they look at their overall clinical impression 80% of the time, um, or the CA125. Some, uh, more than half, 64%, will look at those ACOG guidelines. A few, a third, will look at a validated ultrasound scoring system, although, again, the variability of ultrasounds can make that a challenge, and some will say a few percent of people use other or other combinations of things. Well, why should doctors refer to a GYN oncologist? Well, there's been studies that have shown that if there's early stage cancer and the surgery is done by a GYN oncologist, there's better five-year survival. If you look at the five-year survival for stage one and two and a GYN oncologist does the surgery, it's 83%. And if some other physician, a general surgeon or an obstetrician gynecologist does the surgery, it's only 59%. Even if the woman has advanced stage ovarian cancer, there's an improved median survival in multiple studies. And part of that is because those women are more likely to have what's called an optimal cytoreduction or removal of as much of the cancer as possible that leads the woman in the best place to have a, res a good response to chemotherapy. Okay, so now we're gonna have a case uh, a presentation, a woman who, um, Imagine is being operated on by yourself. You're an obstetrician gynecologist, not a gynecologic oncologist. She's 54, postmenopausal, and preoperatively you've evaluated her and find, found her to have a mass that looked benign on ultrasound. And you did a CA125 and it was normal. And so you planned a laparoscopic unilateral salpingo oophorectomy or USO, removal of the tube and ovary on one side. When you got in, you looked inside and the ovary appeared abnormal. You were able to remove it without rupture and you did a frozen section on, from the pathologist that revealed a high-grade serous carcinoma of the ovary, the most common type of ovarian cancer. The question is, to complete the surgery, do you continue, one, laparoscopically, or two, convert to a laparotomy, or three, do you close and refer? First of all, we have to talk about what do you need to do when you find an ovarian cancer like that. You took it out, the ovary was intact. Your hope is that you found a stage one ovarian cancer. Well, how can you prove that? Well, in order to prove that, you have to do what's called staging biopsies of the cancer. And for an ovarian cancer um, that is apparently stage one visually, 
you have to do pelvic washings. You need to put fluid in the abdomen and slosh it around and take it out and look for free floating cancer cells. Well, you should have done that before you touched the ovary. Um, and a GYN oncologist would have done that. So you've missed one step. The other things that you need to do are what are called random peritoneal biopsies of the pelvis and the abdomen. That's something that can be done laparoscopically and could be done by anyone. Um, just a small piece of the peritoneum or lining the abdomen to be removed. Then you need to do an omentectomy or at least an omental biopsy to remove part of the omentum or the fatty pad we all have inside where ovarian cancer likes to spread. That's technically an easy operation. However, it might not be something that an obstetrician-gynecologist is comfortable doing laparoscopically or even via laparotomy. And then the third option, or the third part of the staging that's really important, is a pelvic and imper uh, pelvic and periodic lymphadenectomy. And that means opening the retroperitoneal space and taking the lymph nodes out that sit by the big blood vessels that feed the pelvis and the vena cava and the aorta. And that is definitely not something that an obstetrician gynecologist is trained to do or comfortable to do. So you could continue the surgery laparoscopically, but you don't have the skills. You could convert to a laparotomy but you still don't have the skills. And then your other option is to close and refer. And then what have you done? You've committed the woman to another operation. If she doesn't have another operation and she's never staged, and you assume it's stage one, 30% of the time you've missed a cancer that's already spread microscopically and might undertreat the woman and basically risk her life. So you never really want to find yourself in this, oper in this situation. But probably of those three options, the, th the safest thing to do would be to close and refer so that at least she could get the correct operation, even if it means going to, through a second surgery and the risks that are entailed with that. So let's talk about managing the un unexpected ovarian cancer. The important considerations are to minimize the risk for rupture. So if you have a mass that's very big, more than 8 or 10 centimeters, um, it's, it can be challenging to remove through either a laparoscopic or a robotic procedure because those incisions are an inch or less in size. There are plastic, sterile plastic bags that you can put in through the abdomen, dump the ovary in, and then pull it out or pull it up to the skin and, and suck the fluid out and take it out, but you still have a risk for rupture. It's also important when you're taking a mass out to do a frozen section for diagnosis because if you have a woman in the operating room and you don't know it's a cancer till later, you miss the opportunity to do the first, the right surgery the first time. And then obviously if it's, if possible, at that first operation, you want to be able to call a gynecologic oncologist. So one option that many doctors will choose to do is if they have a woman with a mass that they're worried at all about is have the gynecologic oncologist quote on call. Probably not the most efficient use of anybody's time, but it's better than not having one available at all. If you do surgery and you open um, and you find advanced ovarian cancer with ascites or carcinomatosis where the cancer has spread throughout the abdomen, it's best to just do a biopsy and close. Um, you want to minimize any delay to the definitive treatment. That woman, the last one with the carcinomatosis, obviously, obviously is going to need another operation by a G1 oncologist if there was, isn't one available. But what you don't want to do is put her through a laparotomy where you haven't done the correct surgery. You want to refer her on to someone who can help her better. Well, what if an OBGYN finds cancer like in our patients? Um, the risk of an unexpected malignancy is that there's no available GYN oncologist around or there's a scheduling con conflict. Um, you do the inadequate staging or debulking by a non-specialist like a general surgeon. Um, you have to switch from a, a minimally invasive surgery to an open surgery without having maybe even discussed that op option with the patient ahead of time and or you delay the definitive surgery and treatment if the patient is closed up and referred. So basically, you never want to be in that situation. I know we've gone through a lot of information today. Um, hopefully you have a chance to take it in and we're happy to answer any questions.